Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are around the world. Uh, I have uh, again the pleasure to welcome you for this new IHCH Junior Clubs. And we have the pleasure today to have Dr. Jessica Stampel, which is uh, working at Yale School of Medicine, that is going to present us a very interesting case regarding the use of the sideroactive treatment in patients with low risk polycythemia vera. And uh, we also have the pleasure to have Professor Nikolai Podolstev, that is also working in Yale School of Medicine. And I am sure we'll have some very exciting discussion regarding the management of these patients after presentation by Jessica. So do not hesitate to send your questions through the chat during our presentations, and we'll try to address uh, all of them at the end of the presentation. So please, Jessica, you can proceed. Thanks so much, Dr. Millard, and thanks to IACH for having us to discuss uh, the use of cytoreductive therapy in patients with low-risk polycythemia vera. Um, we have, these are our disclosures. And the objectives for uh, the junior club is to talk about the definition of low-risk polycythemia vera, incidence of thrombosis and bleeding and disease progression. Uh, we also want to review the management of patients with low-risk polycythemia vera with standard therapy, aspirin and therapeutic phlebotomy, and also cytoreductive therapies, including their indications, risks and benefits. And lastly, we wanna focus on the role of ROPEG interferon in the treatment of low-risk patients with PV. Um, and discuss the results of the low PV study. So our discussion is gonna be centered around this case of a young female patient. She's 46, she has a history of hypertension. She also had a history of endometriosis and needed to have a hysterectomy that was complicated by post-operative bleeding and anemia down to uh, six grams per deciliter and required several units of blood transfusions. Um, but when she came in for a short follow-up visit two months after, uh, she not only had resolution of her anemia, but developed erythrocytosis and an initial workup didn't really show any other causes for this and was again, demonstrated on repeat labs. Um, and if you look at her past medical history, she hasn't really had any uh, cardiovascular events, no thrombotic events in her past. Um, when she was, when we were, when we saw her, we repeated her blood work. Um, I'll highlight that the white blood cell count and platelet count were within the normal range, uh, but her hemoglobin and hematocrit were higher than the, the what's reported as normal here uh, with a hematocrit of 48.8. Um, iron panel also showed some evidence of iron deficiency with a low ferritin level and an erythropoietin level as part of our work of erythrocytosis showed that it was below uh, the lower limit of normal in our assay, which is four. Um, she had a peripheral blood smear um, showing erythrocytosis, some mac microcytosis and hypochromic red cells with anisocytosis. And on exam and on imaging, she had no evidence of hepatosplenomegaly. And as part of, as I mentioned, her work for erythro, uh, erythrocytosis, we had um, mutation studies, molecular studies done, and it showed that she had a JAK2B617F mutation. Um, other mutations for other driver mutations, CalR and MIPL were negative, and a BCR able translocation was not detected. So, following these results, she had a bone marrow biopsy that showed I have the description here, but hypercellular for age with some atypical and increased uh, megakaryocytes with a decreased ME ratio, as well as no increase in reticular staining. Uh, that was most consistent with a myeloproliferative neoplasm favoring polycythemia vera and cytogenetics um, were reported below really show a normal, normal female karyotype. So um, as we're familiar by now, I just wanted to stop and talk about the diagnostic criteria for PB. We're familiar now that the WHO and ICC both came up uh, and published a recent diagnostic criteria for myeloid malignancies and not, don't significantly differ in terms of diagnosis of polycythemia vera, but here I'm focusing on the WHO uh, classification criteria. So we have that patients uh, to establish a diagnosis of PB must meet all three major criteria or the first two and the minor criteria that's listed that are listed in the, on the tables on the side. Um, so the major criteria are to have a hemoglobin greater than 16.5 or hematocrit greater than 49% in men or hemoglobin greater than 16 or hematocrit greater than 48% in women bone marrow with trilineage uh, proliferation with pleomorphic mature megakaryocytes is the second major criteria. And the third one would be to have a JAK2 mutation. 
the minor criteria is listed in the bottom and that's a subnormal EPO level. And if you recall our patient, she had a hematocrit of 48.8. So that would give her the first criteria. She also had consistent findings on her bone marrow biopsy and a JAK2 V6 on 7F mutation. And she also had the minor criteria. So she pretty much met all of them here. Um, so although I just wanted to also take a, take a moment to discuss the survival. And if you see the, the survival curve on the left, you see that uh, there we have all the um, MPNs listed here. And what I wanted to highlight, even though that MPNs share driver mutations, they do differ in terms of their outcomes and prognosis. The, the, line, the black line is the expected survival in the general population. And in green, you see that the median survival for patients with polycythemia varies is 13.7 years. If you, ex if you only look at the survival for patients who are younger than 60, like our patient, the median survival ex extends a little bit more to about 20 years. And despite having a better survival compared to perhaps other myeloid, uh, other myeloid malignancies, they still have a risk for you know, progression about 10% to 10 years for myelofibrosis or myelodysplastic syndromes, and about 4% over 10 years um, to um, a secondary AML. And I will highlight again that patients with PV generally have a longer survival. Um, and this is dictated primarily by the patient's age and the, their history of thrombosis, which is important to take into consideration when we're talking about how to manage these patients. So in terms of the risk for thrombosis, um, patients with polycythemia vera um, are inherently at greater risk for venous and arterial events uh, for many causes. And this does significantly uh, contribute to the patient's morbidity and mortality down the line. Um, their incidence in the general, uh, compared to the general population, is over twice as higher. As you can see on the on the left, the low risk PV patients have about 2.5 events per 100 persons per year, and higher risk patients, of course, have higher a higher incidence of this, um, thus calling it calling them within higher risk. Um, and another important variable is the patient's age. And as you see the graph on the, on the right, you can see patients who have had a prior history of thrombosis or are older, meaning over the age of 65, have um, for cardiovascular event free survival. This other study, which is not um, illustrated, also showed that there was an association between older age and the risk of progression to leukemia, thus showing that patients who are younger than 60 years of age do have a longer survival than those who are older. And multiple studies have confirmed this, this association of thrombosis and increased age with prognosis. Um, so conventionally speaking, now that we know what uh, factors into the survival of our patients, patients are conventionally classified into low risk and high risk disease. Patients with low-risk polycythemia vera are those who are under the age of 60 and do not have a history of thrombosis like our patient, and high-risk are those who are 60 and older or have had a vascular event in the past. And, you know, like I said, low-risk polycythemia vera, their survival is measured in decades, but still it's important that we control for factors that are affecting their outcomes, such as thrombosis, as well as controlling for symptoms that they're living during their daily life because they do have they do have a you know more a longer survival benefit compared to other myeloid malignancies. Um, we also consider the delay or the prevention of disease progression an essential goal to therapy. And current therapies are not yet fully described or shown to alter the natural uh, history of polycythemia and arguably arguably can are not an immediate concern for low risk patients, but it's also something that we are considering and um, take into consideration where we're managing these patients. So going back to the patient, we know that she has a JAK2 V617F mutated low-risk PV based on her age and absence of thrombotic events. And we're gonna discuss now what the best treatment approach is for this patient. So after establishing the diagnosis, regardless of their risk stratification, low or high risk, all patients are recommended to start aspirin low dose uh, once a day, as well as therapeutic phlebotomy to maintain a hematocrit goal under 45%. Um, additionally, uh, patients should, on, should have management of any cardiovascular risk factors they may have. Um, patients who are low risk disease, if they have, can you could consider twice daily aspirin if they have cardiovascular risk factors. Uh, leukocytosis or uncontrolled symptoms within their initial approach. And, you know, on, on the other hand, high-risk patients 
other than receiving the standard, standard treatment, which is in green at the top, they're also started on cytoreductive therapy up front. When selecting cytoreductive agents, uh, we usually choose hydroxyurea or pegylated interferons, depending on uh, the patient's preference or you know, adverse effect concerns or, or past history. Um, and if they've had a, a, a venous thrombosis, they also require anticoagulation. But going forward, we wanna make sure that we're focusing on patients with low risk polycythemia vera, and we'll, we'll keep highlighting this as we go, go through. Uh, so the data supporting the use of standard therapy, meaning aspirin and phlebotomy is supported um, by several studies. And here we have the results of the European Collaboration Study on Low-Dose Aspirin and Polycythemia, or ECLAP, which was published in 2004 in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, so this, this study had a primary endpoint of, of fatal and non-fatal cardiovascular and thrombotic events. Um, and it was a double-blind placebo-controlled trial um, evaluating these outcomes of aspirin versus placebo. Um, I will say that over 500 patients were enrolled, 26% were above the age of 70, and only 11% had had a clot in the past, but uh, around half of the patients were, were receiving cytoreductive therapy. So it was quite a heterogeneous group. Um, and if you can, if you see the graph on the, or the, the curve on the, on the right, um, the conclusion of the study was that 60%, there was a 60% decrease in the risk for arterial and venous thrombosis in patients who were taking uh, aspirin and had a superior thrombosis-free survival and concluded that aspirin was safe and effective in preventing thrombotic complications in patients with PV. It's important to mention that patients who are started on antiplatelet therapy, there's always a concern for bleeding, uh, particularly in MPNs that, or PV that could have increased bleeding risk as well, uh, but they did not find any uh, increase in major bleeding in patients who were taking aspirin, which was reassuring. The second intervention that we talked about that has been uh, shown to be beneficial in patients with PV is therapeutic phlebotomy. And the CytoPV study uh, published in 2013, also in the New England Journal of Medicine, was a phase three study of around 300 to 400 patients um, that randomized patients to either low hematocrit, meaning a tighter control of keeping a hematocrit under 45%, or a higher hematocrit, which is more relaxed uh, uh, values of 45 to 50%. Um, these patients also had a median age that was 64, almost 30% had a prior thrombosis and also showed and also described that 50% of these patients were on cytoreduction therapy, which again can confuse some of the outcomes, but nevertheless, um, patients who had a tighter hematocrit control of under 45% had a lower rate of cardiovascular death and four times the lower incidence of, incidence of major thrombosis um, after they were observed for about 30, uh, over 30 months. But interestingly, um, more than, like I said, more than half of the patients received cytoreduction reduction and arguably could have contributed not only to the reduction of the patient's hematocrit, but also in reduction of the patient's uh, white blood cell count. And this was not accounted for in their analysis. And has raised questions whether this observed benefit was due to lowering of the hematocrit, lowering of the white blood cell count, or, or some combination of both. And lastly, in this study, um, three out of four patients, only three out of four patients were able to stay within uh, their target hematocrit range um, and then exposing some limitations and being able to adequately keep patients at the threshold under 45% of hematocrit. Um, this point was explored further by Dr. Triguero that showed that it's specifically in patients with low risk PV. And this, like I, since they only included patients with low risk polycythemia, they did not, these patients were not on cytoreductive therapy. They were only treated with phlebotomy and aspirin. And they found that about only a third over time uh, were able to stay within under 45% of the hematocrit. If you see the table in the bottom at two years, about 32% were able to stay within the adequate control. And um, about um, 27, 30% of patients needed to start cytoreduction. And the most common reason was due to thrombocytosis um, and other microvascular symptoms, but 
thrombosis occurred in about 7% and the incidence overall was 0.8% per year or 8.5 over 10 years, um, which if you recall from the previous slide is slightly lower than what had been reported, but still higher than the general population. And one last thing to point out in this study is that they identified and described an association of hypertension with a higher risk of arterial thrombosis, which is an important um, cardiovascular risk factor. And if you recall one that our patient had as well. And this was also explored exclusively in patients with low risk polycythemia there by uh, Dr. Barbui on a retrospective analysis of about 600 patients from different centers um, that were belonging to the International Working Group for Myeloproliferative Neoplasms. And these patients, again, were exclusively low risk, treated with conventional therapy. And they found that patients with low risk polycythemia vera who had hypertension had a worse thrombosis-free survival compared to patients who did not have hypertension and raised the question of whether conventional treatment with aspirin and therapeutic phlebotomy alone is sufficient in a subgroup of patients, such as this one, this group with hypertension, if it's enough to reduce the patient's risk for thrombosis and control uh, cardiovascular risk. Uh, another important goal of therapy, other than controlling thrombosis, is controlling symptoms. Um, and we use this scoring system, the MPN SAF TSS, uh, to assess symptom burden, not only at diagnosis or baseline, but to monitor throughout your disease course and during follow-up as it can help identify disease progression, uh, maybe the need to change therapy. Um, and it's scored from zero to 100, 100 being the worst, and each of the variables go up to 10, uh, 10 being the worst symptoms. And you can see there's a mix of symptoms associated with splenomegaly, some abdominal discomfort, some early satiety, and constitutional symptoms as well. Um, pruritus, bone pain, and fever are also included here, but um, I'm sure we're all a little bit familiar with these, uh, with the scoring system. So we wanted to go back to our case now that we talked about this a little bit. Um, and we see that we started our patient with low risk on low dose aspirin, 81 milligrams daily, and she required about three therapeutic phlebotomies per year. With good, good response, she kept hematocrit under 45% and tolerated well for two years. However, um, two years after she started experiencing uh, increase in her symptoms, she had, if you see the box at, at the top, she had worsening pruritus that was eight out of 10, so quite significant with fatigue, inactivity, and bone pain contributing to her total score of 22. She also had symptoms of restless leg and pica concerning for some iron deficiency. And when we obtained her blood work, she was having some progression in her new leukocytosis, also thrombocytosis, and hematocrit was not able to be kept under 45%. Interestingly, we also obtained a von Willebrand factor activity level, which was uh, low concerning, which was low at 35 concerning for acquired von Willebrand syndrome. And at this point, we have to consider doing something different because what we're doing now is not controlling her, her symptoms, is not controlling her counts. So we have to think um, what is the next step and what is the role of cytoreductive therapy? I did want to highlight symptoms a little bit more. Um, there, uh, the, this is a bar graph that shows uh, different uh, points in a survey that I'm just wanted to say that the blue represents patients with low risk polycythemia vera. And these are the results from the landmark NPM study survey of patients with high and low risk polycythemia vera. And as you can see, two thirds of patients with low risk had reported a reduced quality of life, which is the same proportion of patients with high risk PV that reported poor quality of life, with about a third canceling, needing to cancel plans all due to PV symptoms. So patients with PV are frequently symptomatic about two thirds require initiation of cytoreduction reduction for this at some point during the diagnosis. And it's an area of unmet need in this population um, and perhaps supporting the need to start cytoreductive reductive therapy in a, sub, in a select group of patients sooner. Another important, important aspect that we discussed when we we're preparing this is something that our patient had as well, which was an increase in her white count over 20. And there have been some conflicting results in the literature um, determining the association of leukocytosis with thrombotic events, with disease progression. Um, but one of the limitations of these studies is that when they, when they usually um, assess the white blood, 
the white blood cell count at one point in time rather than a measure rather than um, what the trend would be over time. So it would be difficult to assess the dissociation with this. However, current guidelines do support the use of cytoreduction in patients who do have um, leukocytosis. <clears throat> there is one retrospective study over 500 patients uh, across different institutions here in the US that, um, were, that aimed to look for the association of disease progression and leukocytosis. And if you can see, on the, 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 the graph on the, on the left, patients who had a white blood cell count stably over time at, at around 35, which is, what, which is the line in green, they did have an association with disease progression. And I will mention that, these, that this study did not focus on low or high risk. They had a very heterogeneous group as well. Uh, so we'll take that into consideration. So going back to what we can do next for our patient is uh, cytoreductive therapy. Um, <clears throat> generally speaking, uh, patients who require further treatment with cytoreduction, we consider hydroxyurea um, as the first option in older patients due to their lower cost, favorable toxicity profile. Um, we have long-term safety data on this medication, so we're more comfortable with this medication. And then we have ruxolitinib, a JAK1 and 2 inhibitor that is commonly used in polycythemia vera for refractory disease to hydroxyurea or interferon. And I listed interferons lastly because it's what we're going to focus on uh, going forward. Uh, primarily, we use peg pegylated interferon alpha 2A or ropeg interferon alpha 2B. In general, um, interferons have been used for many years. Um, they have uh, uh, anti-proliferative, immunomodulatory, and anti-inflammatory effect. They do have, there are reports that they have disease-modifying capacity. Um, the recombinant interferons have high rates of hematologic response. Um, they can improve symptoms. They also have shown to reduce JAK2V617F allele burden, and it's an agent that is not teratogenic and is used in patients, is a first choice of medication to use in patients who are pregnant. Um, however, they do come with side effects. They're at a discontinuation rate at about 14 to 20%. And these symptoms include flu-like symptoms. Important ones also include psychiatric um, history and autoimmune side effects are things to consider when selecting medications for, for PV. <clears throat> so the, the, the newer interferon that's been studied and we wanted to highlight is ropeg interferon, a monopegylated interferon with extended elimination half-life that does um, enable uh, less frequent dosing that is more convenient for patients, generally every other week or monthly. And it does have an improved tolerability um, and supports long-term adherence for our patients. And its efficacy was evaluated in the PROUD PV and its extension study, the continuation PV, uh, a phase three open label multicenter study that randomly assigned patients with um, uh, a heterogeneous group of patients, uh, either to hydroxyurea or ROPEG interferon, with the endpoint being to assess the superiority of ROPEG in terms of disease response. And if you see after one year, there wasn't a significant difference, but with prolonged and extended use, you start seeing a trend in uh, complete having patients reach a complete hematologic response and, uh, and, and have more patients reach, uh, achieve a molecular response. And primarily you see the difference at 24 months in the row peg interferon group, which is in red. Um, although these results are encouraging, as I mentioned, it, in, it includes both high and low risk patients, but we do have information, we do have studies on row peg interferon alpha 2b focusing exclusively on patients with low-risk polycythemia vera, which is the low PV study. So the low PV study aimed to assess the efficacy of ROPEG exclusively in patients with low risk with a primary endpoint of maintaining the hematocrit. Uh, of, it's a composite primary endpoint of maintaining the hematocrit under 45% without the evidence of disease progression. And interestingly, the disease progression was uh, defined as progressive um, thrombocytosis, leukocytosis, uh, vascular or major bleeding complications, um, not, and not, not, um, did not report progression to other myeloid malignancies. 
So the core study of this uh, was published in Lancet Hematology in 2021 after 12 years of observation. And it's not, it's not illustrated, but 84% of patients in the experimental arm had hematocrit control with no disease progression. And what I'm showing here are the results of the extension phase of the low PV study, which was presented by Dr. Barbouille at ASH uh, this past year. And we see that 84% of, sorry, 81% of patients were able to reach the composite primary endpoint um, com using ROPEG interferon compared to 51% of patients who were just on standard therapy. Uh, hematocrit control was also greater in patients with ropeg interferon, and none of the patients had disease progression um, at the end of the observation uh, period. There was also an important decrease in the mean number of uh, therapeutic phlebotomies per year, uh, with the experimental arm uh, uh, requiring about two to three transfusion, uh, sorry, therapeutic phlebotomies per year, and the standard arm uh, doubled that. When it, in terms of disease progression, there were six patients that had a platelet count progression, and I'll highlight the ones in the bottom. Only two had a splenic infarction, uh, had vascular events, a splenic infarction, and a transient ischemic attack. This positive effect of, of ROPEG um, was not only seen in terms of their composite primary endpoint and hematocrit response, but also had better symptom control at 24 months and improvement in the size of the, their spleen at 24 months. And additionally, patients who had low risk PV on ROPEG had a significant change from baseline of their JAK2V617F allele burden at 12 months, which is more pronounced at, tw at 24 months in, in Dr. Barboy's recent presentation last year. But in summary, the study does show evidence that ROPEG in low risk patients is more efficacious than standard phlebotomy um, and aspirin alone and steadily maintaining uh, the recommended hematocrit goal of under 45% and uh, also has the potential to modify the natural history of disease, which is something we're all seeking and looking, looking to try and do for our patients. I, it's important to highlight side effects as well. Um, as you recall, previous interference had a discontinuation rate of about 14 to 20%. Um, in this study, the discontinuation rate uh, due to an adverse effect was around 8% against statistically di significantly different uh, from the standard treatment group. But none, there was no difference in terms of grade three or four adverse events. And one thing that we wanted to mention here in the US um, is the financial toxicity implications that some of these newer medications have for our patients. So rope pay interferon, the dose, the each dose costs about $8,000 per milliliter and each milliliter is 500 micrograms. So it's, it's an important thing to keep in our minds to discuss to avoid any undue stressors on our patients if they're having financial difficulties. So was, is rope ro interferon worth, worth it for our patients? So if we go back to our case, if we were just to summarize, she was on therapeutic phlebotomy and aspirin. Her hematocrit was not controlled. She had worsening leukocytosis and worsening thrombocytosis. And she also had worsening of her symptoms that were impacting her quality of life. And also I'll, re I'll remind everyone that she also had a history of hypertension an important cardiovascular risk factor. So see, we started her on roping interferon at the dose that was used in the trial I just discussed at 100 micrograms every two weeks. However, we decided to dose escalate somewhat faster to help uh, mitigate and control some of the symptoms that she was experiencing. And within 12 weeks of therapy, she did not require any further therapeutic phlebotomies and was tolerating it fairly well up until around the dose of 400 micrograms where she experienced some mild transaminitis and alopecia. And by going back down on the dose, her uh, liver function tests improve. And more importantly, and she was very happy with the result that her symptoms improved significantly with almost resolution, near resolution of her pruritus. Her score went down from 22 to 12. So overall, the medication, if we know also that there is a, there is a potential for it to modify the natural history of disease, we also need to consider the side effect profile and financial toxicity and have an individualized discussion with our patients when we're starting this medication. 
I wanted to bring here um, our, our, our guidelines, the NCCN. And you can see from, from the left, our patients with low risk are managed, as we mentioned, with aspirin phlebotomy and management of cardiovascular risk factors. And once, they do, once they're having symptoms or other indications for cytoreduction, that's when we consider the initiation of cytoreductive therapy, either hydroxyurea or pegylated interferon uh, alpha 2A or ROPEG. Um, and the symptoms that we, that we uh, evaluate for to determine uh, indication for cytoreduction is new thrombosis or major bleeding, frequent or intolerance to phlebotomies, splenomegaly, uh, progressive thrombocytosis or leukocytosis, and disease-related symptoms. And arguably, we could consider acquired one Willebrand factor here since it can cause increased uh, risk for bleeding. Um, and I will highlight here as well, if we look at the ELN guidelines that were, some, were published in 2022, there is some recommendations on how to use cytoreductive therapy in this population. So they have recommended this for patients who have poor tolerance to therapeutic phlebotomy, have symptomatic or progressive splenomegaly of over five centimeters in a year, or have persistent leukocytosis over 20 and three months. They also recommend maybe considering using cytoreductive therapy in patients who have persistent uh, leukocytosis at different thresholds platelet count over 1,500 with, with or without bleeding manifestations and need for frequent phlebotomies, and they list specifically over six per year and two years. And to consider a clinical trial, it would be interesting to see the role of cytoreductive therapy in patients uh, who have uh, symptoms over 20 uh, that are refractory to other interventions or who are at increased cardiovascular risk. And they do, high, they do list that ropig interferon would be is the preferred cytoreductive agent in this case. When we're preparing this, we're thinking of other cytoreductive, sorry, other non-cytoreductive options to decrease the phlebotomy requirements. And last year, uh, we saw results, of, re results from the REVIVE study um, on risperitide, a hepcidin mimetic. Um, that was used in patients with polycythemia vera that were requiring frequent phlebotomies and cytoreductive treatment and were still struggling to achieve a good hematocrit control. And the results of the study showed that patients were able to um, have a rapid, sustained, and durable hematocrit control over time with a better quality of life and safely take this medication without any significant um, need for withdrawal of the medication or withdrawal from the study. And there's currently the phase three study, the verified study is currently enrolling patients and we're very much looking forward to seeing the results here. So in summary, uh, despite the success of you know, standard treatments, cytoreductive agents when it comes to controlling the patient's hematocrit level, um, available therapies are not clearly demonstrated that they can halt disease progression. And um, the aim of modern translational research at this time is primarily focused on trying to modify the disease course and emphasize with emphasis on eradicating MP and hematopoietic stem cells and achieve a better response this way. So we believe that the treatment paradigm in patients with polycythemia varia is likely to shift from non-selective cytoreduction to early initiation of more targeted therapy that would delete the malignant progenitor cell uh, induce deep molecular response and you know, favorably affect the natural disease course and outcomes for our patients. And there is an unmet need, like I mentioned, for therapies that prevent this. And it's important that we consider select group of patients or that may have a benefit of starting upfront cytoreduction, such as patients who have cardiovascular risk factors or have hypertension, as several studies have shown and as our patient have shown with, with a good response. Um, and I think, thank you, that was it. So uh, thank you uh, very much, Jessica, for this really great uh, overview. It is very interesting clinical case and you give us a very good overview of the treatment for the low risk uh, polystemia vera with the first line and also the second line in case of side effect and so on. So it was very interesting. So I don't know if there is some question, so do not hesitate to send your questions through the chat. Uh, I have a, a first question for you. Uh, we know that with this therapeutic phlebotomy, uh, 
we don't have always a, a good therapeutic effect. And also we have a lot of patients with some fatigue that are very tired with this kind of treatment. Do, do, I, did you see this kind of fatigue with the, with the therapeutic phlebotomy? And should is it a reason just to switch for the interferon and for the hydrea just when patients are very tired with the phlebotomy? So is, uh, uh, is the question to Jessica or should I respond? Uh, he, Jessica can start and after you can... Uh, All right, uh, Jessica, go there. ahead, respond to that. Is fatigue good enough to switch someone from just phlebotomies or ad site reductive therapy? So it does depend on the patient's level of activity at baseline and how symptomatic they are. So if it significantly interferes with their quality of life, their ability to work, their ability to make a living, I do think it's, we, I mean, you know, considering side effect profile and, you know, who the patient is, it's important that we do discuss this. And I would be in favor of, you know, even offering it to, to the patient. Um, if it really is a consider, it's, if it's a consideration that she would need to go back to work or, you know, affecting her quality of life in a major way. Yeah, I agree with that. So it depends on fatigue. And of course, fatigue is multifactorial, maybe related to MPN itself, or maybe related to iron deficiency, uh, which uh, is the ultimate goal for therapeutic phlebotomies, because uh, the idea behind it, that we deplete uh, the body from iron and uh, make it unavailable to uh, hematopoiesis in the bone marrow, and that's why less red blood cells are made. So I think iron deficiency certainly becomes an issue uh, which may affect quality of life of a lot of our patients, and that includes fatigue, but also there are some other uh, symptoms which may be attributed to it, including uh, concentration issue. Uh, so when patients have mental fog or, you know, like our patient who had uh, pica, uh, so basically she has cravings for, uh, she had cravings for ice uh, and the restless leg syndrome, another common manifestation of iron deficiency. Also, these patients may have uh, problems with their hair and nails and uh, 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 glossitis, uh, pain of the tongue, hylosis, uh, when corners of their mouth are affected. So it may be impairing their quality of life significantly. And certainly trying to get them off lobotomy in the circumstances may become a very important goal. So yeah, yeah, thank you. This is exactly the feeling we have. I recently have a patient. It's a very similar situation that was treated in another hospital that received several phlebotomy, and she has a, an iron deficiency. She was very tired, difficult for him to rock with some concentration difficulties. So mainly related to the iron phlebotomy. And the, my, we should explain to the patient. No, but we expect uh, iron deficiency. So we. We should just proceed with the phlebotomy. So, and the patient said, "Yeah, yeah, but I can't live live like that. So this is this my quality of life is it's too poor. So, this so this is very uh, important for us to listen to the patients to analyze the quality of life. And in this case, we decided at the end to move to a reductive therapy, and we expect that we'll be able to improve the quality of life of the patients. So uh, so, so this is why I really find all your presentation very interesting to, to see that we should not only focus on the hematocrit level and so on, and that this is everything that you, we should take into account for the patients. And now if we move so to the cytoreductive therapy, so it was really amazing to, to see the, this result of this prospective study that compare hydroxyrase to this uh, ROPEG interferon, uh, because we show that at the beginning, it seems that hydrea, hydroxyrase was more effective, but with the longer follow-up, it seems to have more uh, minimal, minimal residual disease negativity. So it seems to be a very long-term effect. Do, do we have some mechanism of action? Do we know how it works exactly? It, it's maybe more for you, Nikolai. Yeah, I'll take it on. We don't know. <laughs> so I think immuno, yeah, the interferons uh, uh, are immunotherapy. And, uh, you know, so that in part, be, uh, the reason why these patients may have activation of autoimmune conditions or uh, development of autoimmune side effects. And, you know, so we listed some of them on the slides we Jessica showed, but, you know, at the end, we don't know. We know that it is uh, not a sprint. Uh, it's a marathon uh, with uh, interferons, and you have to wait for them to uh, be fully effective. Obviously, the studies you are referring to is uh, proud PV and continuation PV were studies for higher risk patients, and uh, you know the requiring cytoreductive therapy. It was uh, ROPEG interferon against hydroxyurea, and that's uh, 
uh, the study which led to the approval uh, of ROPEG in both Europe and uh, in the United States. And we saw that uh, there was no difference between hydroxyurea and uh, ROPEG at 12 months time. But then, you know, down the road, you saw improvement in uh, control of hematological parameters, specifically hematocrit and th therapeutic phlebotomies, but also reduction of uh, 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 jak 2 b 617 f variant a little frequency in those patients. And, you know, we think it is disease modifying because of that. We just don't know. We hope uh, that this translates long term in less progression and longer survival. We just cannot design a study uh, because of uh, a long term uh, uh, need for long term follow up. It will be very expensive. So we need to come up with a surrogate. And certainly this is a reasonable one to look at. So uh, some of the patients who are treated with interferons will uh, become undetectable, maybe 20 to 30 percent. And the hope that these patients do better uh, long term from the standpoint of overall survival and disease progression numbers. Thank you. And regarding the um, tolerance of the, the ROPEG, so it seems that it is better regarding the flu-like syndromes, but regarding the psychiatric disorder, did you get some issue? Uh... So I don't know if it is much different. So we uh, still use uh, 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 pegylated interferon alpha 2A, that's uh, Pegasus, and uh, you know it's much less expensive. <laughs> so the problem is it is not approved. So sometimes insurance companies have difficulty giving this uh, drug to us. And you know Ropeg is approved and uh, has an FDA label, so we go to that drug now. So, but uh, uh, the uh, uh, pegylated uh, uh, interferon alpha 2A is the one which we can use in pregnancy. It's category uh, uh, D, but, you know, so we don't really have data for ROPEG in pregnancy, so I would not use that uh, for pregnancy at this point. So from the standpoint of side effects, I don't know if they're much different. Psychiatrically speaking, I mean, ROPEG is monopegulated, so you you can give it every two weeks uh, during the first year, and then when you get them to hematological response, it can be spaced out to every four weeks, so the cost goes down um, after the first year of treatment. Uh, so, but I think you still have to be worried about uh, autoimmune and uh, uh, psychiatric side effects. Uh, so you, it is not the drug of choice for patients who have autoimmune conditions, especially if they're not controlled, or who have a psychiatric problem, in, okay. including depression and anxiety. Yeah, and this is yes, an issue for some patients yes, that can receive it. Yeah, people can commit suicide, you know, so yeah. you have to really be careful uh, yeah. when you assess them. And, you know, so if you try to give it to someone who has psychiatric issues, they have to be under great control and this patient should be followed by a psychiatrist. Yeah, we, we, always, we always keep that in mind when we discuss this kind of patients. And this is very important to, to highlight that. So... Uh, I have just a few questions from uh, from my colleagues. Uh, two of them are asking, yes, so we induce some iron deficiency. So could we use some low-dose iron in those patients? So maybe, Jessica, you can answer on that. I'll, I'll defer to, to Dr. Podolsev, if that's okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, you know, so we do have, I mean, Jessica is in my clinic. You have to remember, so uh, Jessica is our second-year fellow, so she does have some time to learn all of those things. And, you know, so she's in uh, my clinic and we're seeing those patients together. I do have a few who actually take eye and these are patients who have GI bleeding usually. Uh, and sometimes, you know, we do investigation, we just cannot find where the bleeding is from. So sometimes, you know, they're older and they just don't want to do any investigations. And these patients uh, have tendency to run into anemia territory, even though they have PV. And what we know, if we give them just a little bit of iron, this may be sufficient to bring their level, hematocrit level to 45. So we're trying to be very careful. And actually, I titrate it for them. So if the hemoglobin is... Uh, less than eight, it's kind of one pill a day. If it is eight to nine, it's one every other day. And if it is more than a nine, we stop because, you know, if you continue giving them iron, they quickly go up. So uh, in general, for other groups of patients who uh, have PV, uh, iron deficiency is what we desire to control their production of red blood cells. So pulling uh, this in two different directions at the same time is no good. Phlebotomies are to deplete iron and then you give iron to improve iron. So unfortunately, it doesn't work this way. You have to figure out what you want to do. If iron deficiency is an issue, you have to consider alternatives. And that pretty much is cytoreduction right now. That's what is available. And rasferitide, the hepcidin mimetic would be something to consider either on clinical trial or when hopefully this drug is approved in the future, this will be another option for these patients. So, uh, so, so yeah, 
very, very great, great answer, uh, except for the patient that are other cause of iron deficiency. Of course, yes, it's, we, we expect to induce iron deficiency, so you can't do both at the same time, of course. Uh, and now if we go back to the cytoreductive treatment, so what is your algorithm right now regarding the treatment? Because there is interference, there is hydroxyurea. You also discuss a bit roxoritinib as second line treatment. So what are you doing currently? So, so it depends, right? You know, low risk or high risk patient, right? You know, so today we're talking mostly low risk and I can address both, you know. So with low risk patients, uh, uh, the NCCN, you know, there was a slide on the NCCN guidelines. They have both preferred in preferred category hydroxyurea and ROPEG interferon. So if you look at ELN uh, from 2021, they recommend uh, uh, ROPEG as preferred cytoreductive therapy for those patients. And, you know, so ruxolitinib is certainly the second line treatment. Again, we don't really have data on low risk, but a response and response to trials uh, got this drug um, uh, approved for uh, patients who have PV and who are not responding to or cannot tolerate hydroxyurea. So certainly there is good data. Magic PV trial was presented at ASH. It was, was an interesting study from UK. Uh, they followed patients for five years. There was no crossover. And what was found is that thrombotic events are actually better in patients who were treated uh, with ruxolitinib as opposed to best available therapy. And best available therapy, a lot of patients were still on hydroxyurea. This was hydroxyurea failure patients. Also, there was an interesting finding of reduction of variant allele frequency uh, of JAK2V617F mutation, which actually co correlated with better pro progression-free survival, overall survival. You know, so this is the first uh, trial which showed this type of data for ruxolitinib. And, you know, so now you may think maybe it is also uh, disease modifying, who knows? So certainly a good second line treatment in my mind for patients who are not able to tolerate or do not respond to other cytoreductive therapy options. I try to reach out for uh, interferons in younger patients, younger than 60. Uh, so because they will have longer period of time on cytoreductive therapy. Hydroxyurea is a solid, well-known uh, option for older patients. Uh, we do have some data that it is safe for older patients, but we actually don't know, you know, if you give it for many, many years uh, to younger patients, what's going to happen. There's still this lingering concern about second malignancies, uh, including evolution to uh, more aggressive forms of myeloid neoplasms, but we don't really have the data to support it uh, one way or another. And so that's why, uh, I mean, we know that hydroxyurea causes a skin cancer for sure, right? You know, so an interferon does not, you know, so that's why um, I think we try to get interferon to these patients. Obviously, some of them will have contraindications or will not be able to tolerate it. And then, you know, you can consider hydroxyurea in that case too. After oxalitinib in my mind for younger patients. Yeah, so you will put ruxolitinib first in the younger. Yeah, you know, I mean, so with this magic PV data, you know, so I am uh, kind of interested now more in ruxolitinib. I mean, it's much, much more expensive, obviously. Yeah. And also there is concern that this drug can be associated with second malignancies as well. It causes uh, increased risk of skin cancers, right? You know, so uh, we looked at the data for both hydroxyurea and ruxolitinib and all the patients. We, you know, with observation period, somewhere between three and four years, we didn't really find uh, increased risk, but, you know, so this was short and, yeah. you know, we cannot really say what happens if you give it for a long period of time. Yeah, we need, of course, more follow-up for this kind of thing. But so we have also well, take a few more questions. Uh, people are asking regarding the tofacitinib, so the, the new JAK inhibitors. Do you have any data? So, regarding no, that? well, you know, so tofacitinib is JAK three inhibitor, right? You know, so and it is used in rheumatological conditions. So it should so not usually... work. Yeah, you know, so it's, um, uh, you know, we, we see those patients, uh, but um, again, you know, so this is not the JAK inhibitor of choice for myeloproliferative neoplasms at this point. And uh, we also have a question from Dr. Zuba, Zubair Syed that asks for a 60-year-old lady that have hemoglobin level 16, uh, hematrocrit of 47. Uh, she asked for the JAK2 mutation, but she don't have the result. She starts with uh, phlebotomy, aspirin. She says, should we wait for the JAK2 result before we start the hydroxyurea? I think we should establish the diagnosis before we uh, formulate the treatment plan, right? You know, so patient who is 60 years old, you know, if uh, diagnosis of um, uh, polycythemia virus confirmed would be in high risk by definition, you can argue why 60. I mean, uh, what can I say? That's the current approach. But the key element here, the older you are, the higher the risk of cardiovascular 
uh, morbidity and mortality. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, you know, there are other reasons for erythrocytosis. One of the top of the differentials in my clinic would be obstructive sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. All right, you know, so sometimes before you get the results, you kind of get a hint uh, mm -hmm. that perhaps it is primary polycythemia rather mm -hmm. than secondary one. If other counts are elevated, if you have feel the spleen on exam, right? If they have systemic symptoms like mm -hmm. itching, erythromyalgia, mm -hmm. you know, so, but, I would still wait for the results. And uh, we do offer bone marrow biopsy to all of these patients. Uh, sometimes when you know hemoglobin is very high uh, for an extended period of time, we can skip it, but we will not know how much fibrosis these people have. So in a now academic institution, marrow is a standard approach to diagnostic workup in this group of patients. So yeah, it seems to be fair to have all the all the results before to start this kind of treatment. So I think we are coming to the end. So I don't know, uh, Jessica, Nikolai, if you have a last comment, something you want us to share before uh, I thank you. Yeah, you know, I just want to say that this topic is interesting uh, to us because we see more and more patients and uh, with uh, uh, evolution of our options, it is nice to have a look and uh, review uh, what is available. Uh, so the choice of cytoreductive therapy for patients with low risk PV, patients who are younger than 60 and who don't have history of thrombotic events is still not straightforward. Uh, there are certain things which have to be taken into consideration, but obviously engagement of the patient in the discussion about this option, discussing uh, the risks and benefits, and you know, certainly, why don't you give it? Uh, there is risk. I mean, so there is a, a risk of side effects, and uh, we ultimately don't know what the long-term outcomes are, right? You know, so also it is an expensive medication which we have to take into consideration uh, when we're making this type of decisions. Yeah, and there is also the accessibility across the world, right? Not the same, and that of course sometimes you all, you can only use hydroxyurea. So, but still, yes, I agree with you. This is a very exciting field with this yeah. new treatment, with this uh, question that remain open. So we really expect that we'll have some uh, answer into the, the coming years, and maybe also some new drugs, some new treatments. Ferritite, definitely. To, you know, are, so this uh, coming. So. Uh, the resveratide study uh, is uh, really exciting, and uh, the FICE two trial uh, was completed, and I think the data was analyzed. I know that it was submitted uh, for presentation at IHA as late-breaking abstract. I don't know if it was accepted or not, but it is certainly one of those exciting developments which may help some of those patients with low risk PV who require phlebotomies and suffer from iron deficiency. So, so uh, thank you again, Jessica. Thank you again, Nikolai. It was very uh, uh, a great session. Uh, thank you, everybody uh, who joined us, and uh, we'll see all of you very soon for for a new session. So goodbye. Have a good. Uh, thank you for the invitation. It was a thank pleasure. Thank you so much.